Hello, and welcome to episode 138 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. This is John Dinning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. How you doing up there, buddy? I'm doing fantastically well. How about yourself? I don't know if I can go that far. Um, talk to me <laughs> at the end of this episode once these, these drinks are in my system, and I might be in agreement. You should just be happier over the fact that what is really a two-week odyssey <laughs> is now over. That's, is, that's why I'm so happy. It is officially wrapped, which is why we're finally allowed to do this. Uh, you and I have been sitting on some of these comments for over a week now. It's frustrating. Super frustrating. I actually wanted to do a review of the first weekend just a couple of days after it went down, and there were objections to that. So we have held it, but we should have Everybody covered, I think, uh, from the initial test takers to the second weekend retakers to, in fact, since we're recording this on Thursday, the retakers who took it today on Thursday, August 24th, should have everybody covered. But John, you mentioned drinks. What are you drinking? You can tell where my priorities are. Um, Well, I felt like, Dave, two test weeks, which is unusual, means I could reward myself with two drinks. (laughs) <laughs> so here we are. And then I had a, a crisis of sorts. I couldn't decide what I should do for two drinks. I was between an old fashioned and a Manhattan. So I did the classic John thing, which is when in doubt, all of the above. So I've got a Manhattan well, in front of me and I've got an old fashioned in front of me. And I'll be honest with you, drinking them, can't even tell them apart. <laughs> I think that's more referendum on my bartending skills than the, the similarity of the drinks. Yeah, I don't know. I I couldn't tell you which one was which if you put it in front of me. I, I've had old fashions before, and I think that's the one I'd prefer, but I don't really have any real clue about that. The old fashioned's got a those. little bit of, uh, yeah, sugar, and the Manhattan, I think, has a little bit of orange, if I'm remembering how I slapped these things together. No, take it back. The old fashioned has orange, the uh, Manhattan has vermouth. Okay, that's yeah, like that's the why only I like Manhattan. That's the only real distinction between them. I think I like the orange better than the vermouth too. So that's me as well. There you go. I remember now. I don't like a Manhattan, although I like Manhattan, uh, the city, so to speak. There you go. Yeah, city beats the drink. But in my case, they both just taste like bullet rye. So I'm a happy man. <laughs> How about you? What well, you got? Well, I chose a drink in honor of your recent weather experience since you're down in Los Angeles and got to live through uh, Hurricane Hillary and the remnants of that. Uh, harrowing, as well as harrowing, day, my hurricane <laughs> non-experience. <laughs> John, it wasn't so bad perhaps for you in the city, but out in the desert, they did suffer. Yeah, I don't want to make uh, light of the people who actually got hit hard, but here in Beverly Hills, concrete Beverly Hills, we got a little Sunday drizzle and that was the extent of it. And a little Sunday shake. There was an earthquake that day too. A hurricane. A hurricane. Yes, I wish I could make that drink, but I couldn't. Uh, so I got a hurricane, which is a uh, one of my favorite drinks. Lots of rum in there, a lot of uh, fruit juices, and so forth. So you have two drinks. I made one big one, and in a sense, that actually describes the LSAT that we're talking about. It's one big test administration, but it was really multiple small drinks uh, as we went from weekend to weekend and day to day. And we will certainly try to cover all those various forms and keep it logical because I think for us, the biggest challenge is there is a huge amount of information to convey about this test. Um, So I want to get to that very quickly. But first, John, we've got some news in the LSAT world. Usually there's not like breaking news in it, but it definitely is breaking today. What's breaking today? The news is going to break when this is actually released and shortly thereafter. We've got the September LSAT coming up. And that is on the 8th and the 9th. Uh, I have talked to LSAC today. They are going to add an additional day to that that test administration. That breaking news. That's your breaking news. So instead of it just being Friday and Saturday, it is going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday test. Now, don't call them immediately if they haven't announced it yet. This will be announced either on Friday, the day this comes out, or Monday. So wait for them to kind of send that communication. And then the scheduling for that test will open up uh, shortly, probably concurrently with when they send that email. So you're not going to get to the head of the line by calling them if they haven't quite announced it. They told me this would probably come out within an hour or so of us posting the podcast on Friday. But this is pretty interesting, John, because they're now spreading the test out a little bit more. Do you think that's a, a wise thing? 
Uh, yeah, it's clearly a wise thing. And in fact, uh, you skipped a little bit past the song of the day, but it does, in fact, remind me. No, you're good. You're good. Honestly, dude, the analogy you gave with one big drink versus two smaller ones was so clever. I think you get a pass no matter what. I like that. I totally spaced. <laughs> <laughs> I do. There's so much to cover in this episode that getting ahead is, is almost inevitable. Um, uh, but while we're here, the fact that Elsac had this foresight to add another day to basically plan ahead. Um, no, I congratulate them for it. I mean, it ruins my another one of my weekends and yours too. Mm. But it is the right thing for them to do. And the reason I say this is somewhat reminiscent of the song I picked. Um, it's a song on an album that just got released in the last week. It's by uh, an artist named Hosier, Irish artist. And the song I think is the first single on the album. It's a song called Eat Your Young, which is kind of a spicy title there. But apparently the song is based off of uh, a funny old Jonathan Swift satirist essay back in like the early 1700s uh, called A Modest Proposal. And specifically what Swift proposed there uh, was that the poor Irish folks of the time begin to sell their own children to other people for food, as food, uh, in order mm -hmm. to help offset some of the poverty. Great solution. Yeah. And that was kind of his point is that Satire. Satirically, this is humorous to, to say, but in a real world situation with real world problems and practical, pragmatic solutions, it's a little hasty. And that is kind of how I felt LSAC has behaved for this first round with Prometric. It's like, you really could have put some things in place here that wouldn't have got you in this predicament, like an extra testing day. Um, but instead, they went with the slightly hastier option of same as always, you know, business as usual. And it was anything but. So that song reminded me of that essay, which reminded me of the past couple of weeks. And there you go. And I'm hmm. very convoluted, a tangled sense. Um, no, but I like how you tied it into the, uh, you know, the choice of, of acting hastily or slowing down and thinking about it. Um, so, you know, compliments right back at you. And for those of you not necessarily familiar with Jonathan Swift, that is the author of Gulliver's Travels. Oh, yeah. Among quite a lot of so, a lot of people are aware of that. That I think that would be his most famous work. Let's talk a little bit about this additional day that they've added, because I agree this was a good, good decision by them and smartly done to say, hey, let's just make sure. And they acknowledge that. They wanted to spread the test taking load out a little bit. They don't think that Sunday will be as many test takers as Friday and Saturday, because the initial registration has, has been done. But it gives people more options. And if you want to switch your registration from Friday or Saturday to Sunday, you can. There will be both in-person and remote options available. All three days. Obviously, yeah. If, yeah, if you sign up for a Sunday test and it's remote, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's just a volume thing. I do know that Prometric is typically closed on Sundays. So not every one of those centers will be opened up and made available, but many of them will. Well, let's hope Sorry, LSAC least... has the, you know, the decency to let the centers know this last time. Uh, I know last Sunday, some folks in New York wrote a Prometric Center with no luck. I have heard uh, conclusively that that was a Prometric mistake. Uh, they forgot to notify the building super about what happened. And so they were enforcing security and fire uh, restrictions. Hmm. Did you hear that conclusively uh, from LSAC? Yeah, well, I don't think they were very happy about that mistake by Prometric's part. So, and, you know, obviously I share that. The, the people in New York uh, had a tough deal. Nobody needs a bunch of people on the street trying to take the LSAT and having to deal with security and, and people being mean about it. But ultimately, uh, these Prometric centers typically aren't open on a Sunday. So they're opening them up. Uh, that's obviously a big lift when it comes to the amount of work that is there. And you'll have that scheduling, as I said before, for that Sunday test date opening either tomorrow or Monday, whenever they send the emails, when it will open up. They'll also continue to add additional slots as they get centers open and additional time. So if you don't get your exact center for in-person or your exact time for remote, they will continue to add that. So check back and see if something pops up that you prefer. But honestly, between you and me, John, if I was a test taker here, I would probably think strongly about that Sunday test just because I know the volume is going to be less than the Friday or Saturday. And lower volume has historically led to better systemic testing outcomes, fewer problems just because there's less strain on the system. So for me, I would probably say, well, if I'm okay with testing on Sunday, and I certainly am, I might just shift it out over to that. 
Yeah, I'll double down on that and say I'd probably be a Sunday person at a test center, an in-person Sunday person, because we know how, I mean, again, how discrepant it was between people taking remote versus in-person tests and the problems they faced. The in-person experience thus far, and granted, we've only got one test's worth of anecdote, but so far the in-person experience has been drastically better than the remote. It is interesting, though, because that was certainly the case in the first weekend. In the second weekend, there were some issues in both New York City and Nashville mm. uh, that, you know, affected the outcomes uh, a little bit. It wasn't as it, it wasn't as smooth as it was for the in-person people on the first week. And in fact, we have some information on that that we'll get to that we'll talk a little bit about completion rates uh, coming through, especially on the retake weekend. So I'll come back to that because I want to talk a little bit about some of the problems as yeah. well. Yeah. Obviously, you also have the October LSAT that is coming up on the 13th and 14th. The registration for that closes on Thursday, August 31st. That's an important date because it's the day after all the scores will be released right. uh, for this August test. So even those people who took the test today, uh, they should get their scores in six days. But I'm going to give you one reminder, and certainly it's something that I am aware of, the fact that there's a greater and greater number of people who are falling prey to this problem. If you haven't finished your LSAT writing, you will not get a score. You have to have at least one of those on record. And the number of students who have taken the LSAT and who have not completed an LSAT writing has been going up. So you should get your score on the 30th, assuming you have met the requirement of having that LSAT ready. So that's just something good. If you haven't thought about it, get it taken care of. Uh, the system is running fairly smoothly these days. Initially, we had some problems, but that's now a couple years ago. So that's something to take care of. John, let's talk about some of the webinars that we're working on if you're taking that September or October LSAT. Yeah, and there's one shining jewel in this uh, <laughs> firmament. <laughs> I'll run through them, and, and the I think people can guess when I get to the one I'm referring to. A new glittering crown jewel. That's is right, that a saying? diamond in this rough. <laughs> uh, so the next one that we have coming up is actually the day before, the night before score release. It's on the 29th of this month, and it covers advanced conditional reasoning. That's really out of focus towards LR, but it won't hurt if you're struggling with some grouping games, for instance, to see some advanced conditionality. So that's a good one. Uh, it comes on the heels of a basic conditional reasoning webinar that we just had. So hopefully some listeners of this were able to attend that as well. There's another one coming up on September 13th, uh, so just as the September testing weekend wraps up. This is on logical reasoning common flaws, very important, often the most common question type flaw. So if you're struggling with that or just want to learn more, that's a good one. And then a week after that to the day on the 20th of September, you and I have added a crystal ball for the October and November 2023 LSATs. Um, if you're not familiar with the crystal ball, it's quite an event. We're going to make predictions about what we expect to see on those two tests. We'll talk about the frequency of things that we think is going to happen, even into topics that we expect you uh, to potentially encounter. And that's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern that night, which I think is a Wednesday night, if I'm not mistaken. I think you are correct about that. And if, if as John said, you're not familiar with it. Google, the, is the crystal ball worth it? And read the blog that I wrote about it. And really, it's not anything I wrote so much as compiled student comments. That was the most important thing. To me, that's probably the most persuasive look at how various snapshots of students have said, hey, it is worth it. We think it's uh, it's fun anyway. In the, and you don't ever hear that. It's an LSAT event that's fun. That's a rarity right there. So uh, at least we try to keep it uh, moving along quickly and to also convey a lot of useful information. And I can tell you that after this round of tests, we got another wave of messages from students who were like, you guys were on the money. Uh, it got a little bit hazy in that second weekend, which we'll kind of address a little bit here in a moment. But uh, certainly on the first weekend, we started off out of the gate right on point with the predictions down to some of the topics in the reading comprehension sections that were being used first thing on Friday, which frustrated me because then a lot of people couldn't finish their tests or never got to their tests. And I was like, we got this one right. Yeah. So it's another issue though. Yeah. Which we'll touch on. There is one more webinar on the semi-immediate horizon here. It's in October. It's October 11th and it's specific to Logic Games about understanding templates. So kind of a high level idea, a really powerful idea. Uh, another one worth your while. So some good ones coming up. When I said diamond in the rough, I was mostly joking. Uh, but <laughs> if you had to pick one, come join us on September 20th for the Crystal Bowl. 
Yeah. And if you've never seen it, you can at least then know what it's about because that's probably the number one comment I see from people. Is it worth it? What is it? And I'm like, it's, it's actually more comprehensive and more informative than you would think. And even if we were to get every prediction wrong, John, it would still be useful because there's plenty of content that we cover in there that you can't get wrong if you know what you're doing. Talking about question frequencies and things of that nature. To me, that's actually the most important part where tests come from, what kind of tests you should study leading up to the exam. The prediction stuff that we do at the end is fun. We use it to kind of shape problem sets, but we also have a broader eye on everything. So we fortunately haven't been completely wrong yeah. at any point yet, but I'm sure the day is coming. But when it does come, <laughs> it still will not invalidate the first hour and 15 minutes of what we talk about. It only addresses the last 15. Yeah. I now, can say it'd be useful talk- for us too if we got everything wrong, because it's probably the last time we'd attempt it. Uh, it, would te- it would tell us that things have shifted enough that we can't rely on our prediction methodology quite as heavily. Yeah. And it's clear that LSAC is trying to like mix things up and make our lives a little bit more difficult. Uh, and normally after we've had a kind of like two test crystal ball, what we did back between April and June is we did an update. We did a mini ball. Yeah. And I've gotten that question. I know you have too, is will there be a September mini ball? And I can tell you, this is my thought on this. Had the August test gone as expected and it was two days and then basically over, I think we would have had time to put a September mini ball in place. We probably would have done it this this week, actually. That's probably what we'd be doing well, now, in fact, or at least maybe last you're, night. Yeah, you're exactly right. We probably would have done it last night. Do I think that there's enough change that occurred from the first test to the second to warrant it? Yes, I actually do. Do we have time to do that? Unfortunately not. Uh, You and I may be very good at predicting which LSAT is going to be used, but it was not uh, within our ability to predict that there was going to be two extra test days added uh, this administration and that the final retake would be pushed back from Tuesday to Thursday. And so our calendar is set. So I'm out, I'm out of town next week. I'm taking a trip with some friends to Las Vegas. I know you got a vacation scheduled uh, as well. So we're going to run out of time here in, in terms of being able to do this. And what I would say is if you're looking at that and you're thinking, okay, how do I adjust for that? You'll hear topics that we put up. You'll hear some discussion of various things that were in that first one. Just eliminate those from the list and move everything else up one. (laughs) Yeah, uh, that's one way to think about it. What I've been encouraging students to do, uh, and if you're not aware of this listening now, you can actually go watch the crystal ball for free uh, for the September test. The August and September crystal ball that we did is still available for everyone. You can go right to our website. There's a form on the main page at powerscore.com slash LSAT where you can put your email in and we'll send you a link to it. So you can actually go see what we're talking about still. What I've been encouraging people to do with that content in the crystal ball is to focus more on the conceptual ideas that we cover. And what are they really doing in terms of like trends and tendencies in reading comp or logical reasoning? What kind of games are they leaning into now? What are the odds that you see an outlier game? And if so, what type is most likely? Those are things that hold completely true for September. I wouldn't make a single change with any of that. So- any that's, of, yes. that's the first hour and 15, and that's hour and 20 the, minutes. Yeah, of that. 80%. That's the meat of it. it. Right. So anybody who wants to watch for that is still going to get a ton of value from it. At the end, as you'll hear in this discussion, the test that we predicted has already happened. So <laughs> we, uh, you can just check that box and yeah, kind of close that door. <laughs> but yeah, there's still a yeah, ton that's... of value to be had in that session. So if you haven't watched it yet and you're taking September, do yourself a favor, go check it out. Yeah, nothing changes in the first hour and 15, hour and 20 there. It's only the last 15 minutes that apply to that idea of like, check those off and move them up Yeah, uh, to some extent, at least in terms of the tests. So just wanted to address that though. And uh, even, you know, you try to do a mini ball and it's like four or five days before the actual test. I don't think it's enough. I think it's actually more of a distraction at that point. We didn't want to cause any kind of issues like that. So go back and reuse that original one if you haven't had a chance to already. And on that note, John, let's get to the August 2023 test. Now this is part two of the discussion. This is the content breakdown. So that means there was a part one that we did uh, a week ago or so. This was a broad discussion of the types of problems that happened, uh, how to move forward, what to look out for. Um, kind of like some of the choices you might want to make in terms of your own testing experience. So that all still applies. If you're interested in the broader discussion, go back and re-listen to that episode. 
but let's at least take a look at the retakes, especially the second weekend, Saturday and Sunday. John, how did you feel like the retakes went? Much better. Much, much better. Clearly. Um, yeah, and that could be because it was a smaller volume, but I think it's just that they needed some failure to get their ducks in a row, so to speak. Um, I think what happened that first weekend was so just calamitous that it woke everybody up and showed LSAC exactly what they needed to do to improve things with Prometric. So clearly yeah. they made some adjustments over the course of that in-between week, uh, and it showed for the better. So that was good. Yeah, I would say that it woke Prometric up quite a bit. Uh, I'm sure LSAC went in a little bit nervous, but Prometric probably thought to themselves, oh, we do this all the time. Right. We know what we're doing. Yeah, this is a different type of, of vehicle that you're dealing with. I can say this much, that if you take a look at the in-person testing from the retake weekend, uh, the stats that they passed along to me was outside of New York City, where they had the building issue, and Nashville, which had a Comcast outage that affected the center there, in-person test takers finished their exams at almost a 100% rate. That doesn't help the people who were affected in Nashville and New York, obviously, but outside of those locations, they had widespread success. This is one of the reasons like right now in-person testing is, is very attractive. On the remote side, though, it's very interesting. The test taking success on the remote side was about 98% completion, which is pretty typical, apparently, of the prior LSATs that we had with Proctor U over the last few years, uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic. So this was more of a normal experience. And sure, you had lower volume, and I think that makes a difference. I think that's why they added the test date in September mm -hmm. to kind of spread even it, out. it out a little bit. Yeah, it's a smart decision. You can see how they use this experience to say, well, what should we do in September? Let's make our lives easy. And they made the intelligent and really student-friendly choice. I don't know what it costs. I honestly don't care what it costs them or Prometric. That's not the issue at all. But they they bit the bullet and they, they did the right thing here. So yeah. retakes went much better. Uh, today, I did not hear of any issues for the Thursday, the 24th retakers. If there were any, it's, it's definitely possible. We just haven't heard from them. Any other issues that we know of from the retake or anything we didn't cover last week that you think is worthwhile? Yeah, I think Jonathan Swift would be quite proud of them adding that date um, at the foresight involved in that planning, <laughs> as opposed to the scramble after the fact. Um, Your new friend, yeah. Jonathan. <laughs> just the, the, the gall to write an essay about hey, here's a problem. Here's a solution to your poverty. You got too many kids and they look delicious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd always ridiculous. Yeah, I read that essay in college, I think, and it cracked me up. Were there other issues maybe that we could continue to see going forward? There are two, I think, that, that stand out to me and you may have more. Um, but the two that I can think about, one had to do with the new text search quote feature that LSAC has baked now into the software, the interface itself. For the longest time with these digital tests, you were allowed to use control F or maybe command F, whatever it is on a Mac, to do the typical text search. And people in reading comp in particular found this to be a very helpful feature. And it got used a lot and there was some confusion as to whether it was allowed or, and it was, and they've replaced it now, if you're unaware, with an own little text search feature in the interface that seems by all accounts to be really glitchy and buggy and slow. Um, not nearly as user-friendly as the classic Control F was. So I'm hoping they iron that out with some continued improvements. This is the first test in August they'd ever used it or done it for. So it's brand new. It still felt kind of beta. Um, but that was one issue that people had. So if you go into this thinking you can use Control F still in September, you cannot. Uh, if you go into it thinking they've replaced it with something just as good, r reports so far suggest that's not true either. Yeah, and this was, you know, first off, proof of the fact that Control F was always allowed. Yeah. Just like we've been saying for a long time. Uh, but Control F was a browser function. It was built into the browser, and that's why they decided that it would be really difficult to stop a core browser function. So they allowed it to be the case. And in so much so that they felt maybe that it wasn't clear out there as to what was available. So they did, in fact, at the top of the screen, you now have a little box that you can type in. But now it's a part of the program. It is not a browser feature, and so maybe it just needs a little bit more work uh, to kind of get out. But sometimes people talked about like the annoying way that it worked or the slowness of what it works. So that was definitely one of the issues. I totally agree. Uh, that's probably going to improve over time. The other that I heard about, I know you did too, because it was kind of everywhere for a minute, 
is a weird one to me, but it had to do with the in-person Prometric scratch paper, uh, which is when you show up at the test center for Prometric, you don't really need to bring much. I saw people like, do I need to bring my own computer? No, they provide the computer, they provide the proctor, they provide the scratch paper. Um, but the scratch paper they provide, for whatever reason, is colored. It's not white. I heard some people say it was pink, some say yellow. And I know for a lot of people, it made legibility an issue. It was a lot harder to read the notes that people had written on this colored paper than it would be on a, against a white background. Yeah. So I, I have, realized again, that this is strange. You may have a better explanation as to why this is the case. I'm sure test security is the ultimate root cause, but. It is the ultimate root cause. Although, you know, some people speculate that maybe it was a Barbie marketing tie in. That's why they got the pink paper. The Barbie marketing has been phenomenal, probably the best I've ever seen for a movie, but they're not this good. Uh, they weren't able to tie it into the LSAT. I hadn't heard that it's, speculation, but I love it. <laughs> a little Gosling watermark in the corner. I love it. Anything that's, uh, you know, pink these days has got Barbie written all over it. Uh, ultimately, it is some kind of test security issue. And I don't know that I totally understand how white paper is not secure. Maybe it's seeing it from a distance and they expect somebody with like a telescopic lens to be looking over your shoulder through the window. I don't know. But they do give that to you at the center. They usually were giving people a pencil too that was the classic kind of school pencil you know, a bad eraser, the point wasn't sharp, you know, that just kind of like nightmare of, all right, it's going to break at any minute. So just be aware of the fact that in person they do that. And this is a great example of how there's no perfect experience. Some people just really didn't like it. They couldn't read what they were putting on the notes very well. And unfortunately, Prometric was absolutely adamant that that's the way that it was. They would not allow you to do substitutes. The one thing you do need, by the way, to bring to a Prometric Center is your uh, password yeah. to get into your Law Hub account. And that's something that uh, we talked about last week. So just be aware of that. But most everything else, aside from like something to drink or what have you, is provided. Yeah. My thought on the scratch paper thing is it would be far easier for someone to bring in white scratch paper of their own. And with like notes or some pre-written, I don't know, uh, something on it. And maybe that's what they were trying to prevent. The way that music festivals do like different colored wristbands for the different days. That's kind of how I saw this here is it defeats the ability for someone to anticipate the color of the paper they're going to get. So they can't bring in their own. But I mean, this feels like, again, that might work for an algebra test where you've written out a lot of formulas or geometry or something. You can't really write out notes to cheat on the LSAT. So I'm not sure yeah, what they're it, specifically doing here. I don't know. They're crazy. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to it. Yeah. As usual, when we talk about test content and then we talk about test scaling predictions, the first thing we start with is a list of reminders and disclaimers about the content that we're talking about, test difficulty, all these other types of things. Uh, and so I'm just going to run through those relatively quickly here. The first one is the same as the last one, and that is please do not summarize this online. Summaries miss the nuance, and especially on this test where there are multiples of every single section, four and five uh, of scored sections in each one. We want people to hear what we have to say about this directly. This is a lot of content. A summary will never catch all of that. I'll also remind people that section order and taking on a particular day are meaningless. You and I can take the test at the same time and have the same section order and still not have the same content. Or even if we had the same content, you might have your experimental sections in reverse positions. So nothing about section order is indicative. It never, since we started this whole process uh, for years now, it hasn't been. So don't say, oh, you had LR first, so did I. That was a hard test. You have no idea if you're even talking about the same test. When you talk about uh, disclosing information, at this point, we are past the complete conclusion of the test. Even the retakers have gone through. Uh, typically, what LSAC allows is a broader discussion of topics and generalities. They do not allow us to talk about answer choice solutions or rules in a game or what have you. Uh, they don't want that posted about. Obviously, they're not uh, too chafed about the fact that we're going to disclose what reading comprehension was scored and what reading comprehension might have been experimental and so forth. But I will say that information that we get 
does impact the information that we put out. If we don't hear from you, if we don't get a summary or a synopsis, we won't know to count you in the process. If you were a person who had a real outlier version of the test, and there are definitely some people like that, if we haven't heard about that, we can't mention it and at least refer you to where you should go to get more information about this. So keep that in mind, especially for this episode or any future episode. Another thing I'll remind people is that taking the actual LSAT almost always feels worse than taking a practice test. It is real. You know there's pressure. That gives you a negativity bias that tends to creep into your recollections. So for a lot of times, people will walk out and say, that was the worst thing I've ever done. That was the hardest LSAT. Probably wasn't, but it was the most intense experience, especially if it's your first LSAT and you know that it's counting. Uh, It can be a scary experience. So when you hear us talk about difficulty, you may think that was the hardest RC section of all time. And you might hear us say, well, that was a medium RC. Just keep in mind when we talk about difficulty, whether we say it's easy, medium, or hard, it's all hard. It's just bands within that high level of difficulty. I don't think there are any easy LSAT sections. I think they're all challenging. But I do know that some LSAT sections are more challenging than others. And so it's that relative difficulty that we're talking about. Just keep that in mind. I don't. Sometimes we see people say, like, they said it was easy. I'm like, no, no. We said it was super hard, but on the easy side of hard. (laughs) So just a small thing there. Also keep in mind the test makers actively attempt to confuse people by placing the same topic in multiple sections. For example, I was trying to work out two LR sections, John, and they both contained uh, questions about caffeine. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, you got to be, was this the one about the caffeine and the soda? You know, which one was it? They do that intentionally. We've seen them do this for years. It can make figuring out which section was real or not real as a test taker difficult afterwards. It's why it takes us a while to figure out as well. Also, keep in mind that our estimations of what is real and what is experimental are based on certain assumptions about test reusage, namely that prior scored sections are typically not going to be experimental sections. Uh, So be aware of that. So far, to our knowledge, we've never been wrong about identifying something as real. And so ultimately, we're very confident in what we're saying, but it is built upon assumptions. You never know when LSAC decides at some point in the future that they want to, you know, change the rules. It's their game. They can do that. It is also possible that you don't hear your section discussed, or you may not recall the questions that we mention in specific. This does happen, Uh, especially now these days, information online is relatively limited. Sometimes we miss things if someone doesn't convey that they had a particular section, or, you know, they might hear a question that we've described as sand vipers, and they remember it as, you know, venom in the blood. Same question, described two different ways, uh, can make you think, well, I didn't have that question. And that's an example from tonight, actually. So as we move forward with this, just keep in mind, sometimes you'll be like, wait, was that a question I had or not? And then last, the same as the first, we ask that you please do not summarize this online. It's a free podcast. You can send people right to the, you know, the timestamp and say, just listen to it from, you know, minute 25 on or whatever it may actually be. Uh, We just would prefer people hear us talk about this directly. And with that, John, we now arrive at the moment to cover what is real and what is experimental. And it's going to take a little bit, so we're going to try to do this fast. Yeah. Well, thank you for for handling all of that on your own. Every time we do one of these, you go through that laundry list of uh, tips, I suppose, and it just gives me way too much time to drink. So (laughs) I'm starting to enjoy doing it. I I always enjoy when you do it because I just sit back. I know what I'm going to say. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you're right though. That last point, I'll, I'll reiterate a final time. It's kind of the first two rules of Fight Club, which is, you know, if anybody asks about it, just send them here. Don't talk about this online because you're going to miss some nuance and some detail and it's going to lead to more confusion than it's going to solve problems. So there you go. All right. All right. Let's, let's do this. The domestic, uh, it's the only type we had this time. There weren't any August international tests in this go round. So we're going to keep things mostly stateside. August 23 LSAT, and the way that we tend to start these discussions, I'll lead in with here as well, which is a self-assessment, let's call it, a self-review. How did we do with the crystal ball uh, for the August, September, where we made some predictions, some very specific predictions about what we thought was likely to happen? And I'm happy to start with this because the news for us is good. We nailed the test. The test that people got that first Friday of testing was the test that we said was the most likely one to be used, reused, which was the January 2022 LSAT. 
So about a year and a half ago, we first saw some of this content. We expected it to come up again here in August. And sure enough, right out of the gate, uh, all three sections from that test were in use. The downside, of course, from that, as you mentioned, and I'll reiterate, is that was also the worst testing day of all, I think. So the day where we had the greatest success and people who listened to the crystal ball had the greatest opportunity is also the day when the fewest people were able to take the test as planned. So it, and it, it was used on both Friday and Saturday. Yeah, it came up again the so next day. So it wasn't day, the which... people on Saturday didn't get a chance to get to it. And we talked about this test in the Crystal Wall. We actually referenced all of the reading comprehension from this test and certain logic games and LR from it as well. So, I mean, on Friday morning, as the day dawned before things went to hell, uh, I think, you know, our th our moment was, this is nice. It's always great to start off and begin to realize, hey, this was the test we thought was most likely to be used, and it is being used. It makes you think that it's about to be an easy weekend. Yeah. Obviously, things changed from that. So, let's talk a little bit about that. And in the logic games, when we take a look at this, we will find that there were really multiple sections that were out there that were being used. Test takers saw at least four different sections. In fact, I know they saw uh, at least five different sections, but I'll reference one of those sections because it was such a small subset of people a little bit later. Wait, there when were you really say five different sections, let's clarify that because I think that could be a little confusing. There were five different, and we're, we're going to focus on the main four, four different scored game sections that people could have had. Uh, as they went through this entire exam. So the vast majority of people will hear one of these four. Uh, there are some people that uh, would have had a different game section that I'll just mention at the very end because it was, again, a small handful of people. But the interesting thing was no experimental games that we encountered. Didn't see any talk of it online. We certainly didn't get any comments to us about it. And we've said before that if they're going to change logic games in 2024, you would expect that experimental games would be a thing of the past. That has been the consistent truth now for six, eight months or so. Yeah. So so let's, uh, I'll go through the first weekend, John, or you could, if you want to do the first weekend, you tell me. You know, we'll you did the... just do that whole long thing. You must be getting thirsty. Let me take it. <laughs> you do it. All right. Um, I expect to hear sips in the background, Dave, I'm hazing you. So I'm picking, you can hear my glass. I'm picking it up. I can't hear it actually. What we saw through that first weekend, as Dave has mentioned, is two different sections of scored logic games, the only logic games that we saw since there weren't an experimental. And the first set that we saw coming out bright and early that Friday morning is the set that we predicted from January 2022. 23 questions. These four games were real. So if you had this section, this counted, obviously. Uh, it started with a game about a fruit display, lime, mango, nectarines were in there, uh, and you're picking from among the fruit. There was a game in there about landscapers and landscaping, different clients being uh, serviced over five days. There was one in there about uh, short stories, I think the order they were published or something. And then a tricky game at the end about actors and performers with different scenes over the course of four different days. So a lot of moving parts in that game that I think gave people trouble. And the fact that it was game four is never easy. So. There you go. That was one section of games, the one that we predicted. There was another set of games, though, in use that first weekend, which was a new section of games. So no predicting these. It's the first time we've seen them. These were real. Uh, 23 questions. These were primarily given from what I saw on Saturday, but I think both days were open to it. Here were the four games in this other section of real games. Uh, I think the first was about ordering six things. I believe it was movies, but a little bit of uncertainty there. The second game was about books in a book club being read. Third game, seven departments in three different buildings, recreation, sanitation, zoning. Uh, and then again, wrapped up with a tricky game in four about medical interns who do rounds in four different specialties, pediatrics and things. So again, a hard game to, to conclude that section as well. To me, when I saw those two sections more or less happening simultaneously through that weekend, the parallelisms between the two, the similarities between the two were, were kind of striking to me. Uh, and that's always a good thing, ultimately. You don't want two sets of games that feel wildly different in difficulty or wildly different in terms of like types and content and stuff. These two were, I don't want to say identical or mirror images, but they were close. Yeah, and especially with that uh, second set there, the ones with the uh, the seven departments, including like recreation and sanitation, the first two games in that section were not the most challenging games. Uh, they were certainly on the easier side of logic games. Then that third game, 
is a little more time consuming, some tough questions in there. And then that last game, the hardest, uh, I think, yeah. for almost everybody who did this. Just a lot of information floating around, uh, a lot to track, uh, certainly n- not the most normal type of game type that you would encounter. And that's very similar to the other section mm-hmm. where the earlier games weren't No one was saying this was impossible. And then as it went on, it felt a little bit harder. But neither of these sections was just, you know, brutally difficult. Uh, No one was really complaining. Logic Games was killing me on this. That isn't to say people didn't have hard games or didn't feel that those games were hard or didn't struggle with them. It's just the overall kind of like broad-based chatter. Now, those were the two that we saw the first weekend. As we went into the second weekend, it's my understanding that there were some people who did still see those. Uh, they still mix them in. This just wasn't nearly as many. So do you want to cover the retake users who went really into that Saturday and Sunday the following weekend? Yes, let's do it. What we saw the next um, <laughs> makeup test weekend, so the two days that they added the following Saturday and Sunday, uh, they pulled out new games for it. Only one section of real games that we saw, no experimentals. But here's what we saw on that makeup weekend for the first time. But, and as Dave mentioned, I want to make this really clear. If you took a makeup test on that weekend, you could have seen one of the sections of games I just talked about. But most of the makeup people instead saw these four games. 23 questions. These were real. And the source of them was the January 2020 LSAT originally. These had been reused a year ago. Exactly a year ago in August 2022. So we had seen all these before. uh, And here's what they were. The first game was about student presentations. It was a school project assignments game. Second game was about people uh, traveling to various towns. I I heard some people say it was a veterinarian going to clinics or something. Yeah. Third game, pretty recognizable, was about senior and junior employees uh, in different types of divisions, leadership, management, production. I think there may have been some training involved in that. And then the fourth game, easily the standout in this, both in terms of topic and difficulty, was about three breweries serving three types of beer, lager, porter, stout over nine weeks. And it occurs to me now, Dave, that we may have made a poor drink choice today. Maybe we should have had a beer. <laughs> no. All right. At the end of this. Not in a beer up. mood. All right. Um, but that was the fourth game on that test. And it was tricky. That was a hard game, kind of universally described as difficult. Like you got like 27 spaces that you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a challenge. But notice how this section mirrors the first two. Mm-hmm. The first two games aren't terrible. The third game is all of a sudden more challenging, more time consuming, some hard questions in it. And then the last game comes in and it's supposed to be the hammer blow. All three of these sections are really similar in terms of their overall setup. Uh, and this is something that is consistent. Even when we get to the last section, we're talking about the fourth uh, section from the retakers today, it has a similar setup as well. So if you're thinking about facing logic games, the real kind of like advice right now is, is make your money on games one and two, get out there, get ahead of the curve on time, uh, get those, you know, locked in, prepare to slow down a little bit in the third game, and then, you know, hope that something impossible isn't lurking as the fourth game. But that's the way these sections are being set up right now. Yeah. Let me tell you why this particular set of games is both surprising and concerning to me, at least, is because this was the third reuse in about three and a half years of these games. We'd seen them in January 2020. We'd seen them reused last August. And for us, that means put a pin in them for quite a while because that's enough. Most of the reuses that we're seeing now are a first reuse. This was a second reuse and a fairly mainstream one. Now, granted, it was one of those like in case of emergency break glass situations. They did this not as necessarily a plan, but as sort of an emergency. However, it is if this becomes the new normal, it's going to make our predictions really difficult going forward. So just... Full disclosure, full disclaimer, that uh, if they start doing this with third and fourth reuses of tests, it's a crapshoot as to what you're going to see. Yeah, this this throws a wrench in the works when they start reusing tests more. And of course, here it is, it's it's a self-inflicted wound with an (laughs) extra day. And I can imagine, if you think about it, if you're setting up tests, you're setting up a schedule, we're going to use this, then we're going to use this, we're going to use this. And now all of a sudden you have two extra days. Mm Mm-hmm. What are we going to do? And you're scrambling. And so they brought something in out of the blue. And so this is where, you know, John, you and I knew we're like, this is very likely going to be a test that isn't on the kind of like 
generalized list of what we might think. Yeah. The beautiful thing about the crystal ball, though, is as we've said, the first 75 minutes are about what is most likely to occur. Um, and that actually does match these games. It does it does match that. So we knew that the advisement that we were giving, which was like, use the current crystal ball, it'll still help, uh, was going to be critical. But this is one of those things like you can't, it's a comet, it's a meteor from out in space. You just can't predict what it's going to do or yeah. where it's going to smash. And so that is just something to think about. We take it seriously when we make predictions. I know some people are like, oh, you know, they're just having fun or it's not really accurate. I'm like, no, no, no. We actually try to make it really accurate. Uh, we invest a lot of time in it. And that's one of the reasons I think we've been really very accurate in doing it. Mm -hmm. But when they start getting to this third and fourth reuse in a short period of time, if they're going to use a test three times in 18 months or 24 months, that puts a lot of pressure because now the choice selection is so varied, you really can't tell. We'll have to look at the patterns. We'll see how this affects things going forward. But I would think that there'll be effects next year, if at any point here soon. Yeah. As a segue into this final set of games, I'll make this comment as well, which was I had a couple of students, savvy students, who were able to track down based on the games they saw in the makeup, like the brewery game, for instance, is pretty infamous at this point. They were able to track down where some of these first appearances were. The comment I heard from a couple of people is, huh, they really like this stuff for August, don't they? Because they used it again last August 2022. They've used it again this August. And my knee jerk to that was, no, nah, no, no. They don't really pay attention to like the dates. They're just trying to make sure they spread them out enough where there's no repetition or duplicate exposure. And then we got to today's makeup. <laughs> and what do you know? There's another August test. And I'll, yes, ex indeed. I'll explain what that means going through it, but now I'm starting to think, and again, I think this is mostly coincidence, if not entirely coincidence, but I did think it was funny that this thing that I kind of like, you know, dismissed, if you're looking at it again today, you do start to suspect things. Here are the games from this, today's 824 makeup. And there, again, I think you said there were about a hundred people that took it today. So this was a really small group. We've only heard from a few people. Um, but hopefully this matches for all 100 of you if you're listening. Here were the real games from today. 23 questions. And these have got a bit of a history to them. We saw these first in October of 2020. We saw them again. And here's the August of August 2021. So games from August 2021 got used this week. Games from August 2022 got used this week. And we saw some new games for August 2023 get used as well. Here are the games. Uh, it was a first game about summer camp activities, hiking, painting, skiing, the order that people were participating in those. Second game was about musicians going to auditions, to concert halls, and you split the performers up by time, 9, 10, and 11, I think is when the auditions were. Third game, clay tablets and artifacts, ancient artifacts, and it was about their ages. So these anthropological discoveries um, being ranked or ordered. And then finally, again, the hardest game kicked in here on the fourth and the hardest, I think by far, which was about fashion brands and different magazines. Um, a lot of questions in that game and a lot of moving parts, five variables, I think on three different like magazine uh, distribution. So a tough, tough game again for people. And the fact that it's fourth obviously just compounds the difficulty. We'd seen these before. I'm a little surprised they broke out a new section just for the 100 people today. New in the sense that it's the first we're seeing it for this go round. But here we are. And that completes the four different sets of scored games that we have seen since the August test started, what feels like two months ago. Yeah, and notice how that fourth game is the killer again. Mm -hmm. So that and that. The other thing that was, I think, disturbing to us, John, is, is that this game set last was used in April of this year yeah. as an international test Glad you brought that uh, up. game section. And that really bothers me because when you start to take a look at the reuse here, this is being used multiple times. So we'll come back to the idea of you know how this affects crystal balls in the future. Uh, I think we've covered it here primarily. But these were the four logic game sections that the vast majority of people should have seen. All of them were scored. We'll come down uh, in a few minutes and work through the uh, kind of like the scaling prediction on that. So when we get to it, we will get to it. But as we said before, we didn't see any experimental logic games. So if you were somebody who had that, 
Uh, we don't know you exist. We suspect you don't exist, but I'd like to know if you do in fact exist. Let us know. And it's funny. It's funny too, John, because I put in so much time that first weekend as did you. And I was listening to you talk about these and I was like, I've forgotten all this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, it feels like it was far longer than a week and a half ago. Yeah. I'm having, okay. I'm having that same kind of out of body moment. It's like, oh yeah, they did just do that 12 days ago, whatever it was. Yeah, so let's get into reading comprehension. And we did see some experimentals here, so I think it'll be a little bit more illuminating. And apologies for the lengthy kind of discussion about this. But let's talk about what they actually covered. And I'm going to focus primarily on the first weekend, that Friday and Saturday. I'm going to start off with a real section that was 27 questions, and it was from the January 22 L set that we predicted. Some of these topics we had right up on the crystal ball screen, such as there's an abstract passage about the 19th century author uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Borges, and we had put up Borges on on there, and several people were like, I'm really glad I read about Borges beforehand. Uh, there was a passage, the second one, about really bioengineered, uh, genetically modified uh, type of food and the product labeling regulations around that. There was a passage about violent movies and the media causing violent behaviors in children. That was your comparative passage. And then a last passage that was very difficult uh, for most people, and that was about large gas giant planets and their cores and a theory about how they are ultimately created. So this is a section that we've seen before. It is not an easy section at all, but that is a real section. So if you had Borges on your test, that was the scored RC. Next, we had a section that was very interesting to both you and I, John, because we've seen part of it before, mm -hmm. but they've changed part of it. And they've done this now uh, more than once in the last couple of years. But this was a real section that was also 27 questions. They, they used part of the January 2020 LSAT. They started off with a passage we've seen before. It's about airplanes and flying into volcanic ash plumes. Uh, and so forth. This is one that has appeared on a different section that has not all four of these passages. There's another second comparative passage. It's about microhistorians. This was new in here versus traditional historians and then microhistorians versus biographers. Uh, talking about different viewpoints. Then there was a third passage about Native American sovereign immunity and tribal sovereignty and contracts and, and kind of working things out. And then finally, the last um, particular set here was about diet shifts being supported by kind of like scientific isotopic evidence and really just piling in on uh, the views of Milner uh, and how Milner was wrong. It's James Milner, if I recall correctly. So I was thinking about the Liverpool midfielder, or maybe I just got that confused. Maybe it's Robert Milner. I don't have a clue about any of that. Former uh, Liverpool midfielder. Anyway, that was a real section. In the cases where these sections were paired with another passage set, it was an experimental section. And I'll just read through it just because those of you who had it uh, can recall what it was. The first uh, passage in the experimental set was about kind of like how these zombie arguments never die and then talking a little bit about Shakespeare in that context. Then a really interesting sound passage about Mayan cities built on kind of like these bajos and what became swamps and then were later abandoned and why that would have happened, how it could have happened. Then a comparative passage set about ancient aliens as a show and alternative archaeology. And then finally, a passage about uh, Bentham, uh, Jeremy Bentham, and international law. So, unfortunately, this set was often cited by people as being on the easier side compared to their real set. So, yeah. of course, it was unscored. <laughs> uh, but at least you know that was experimental. But that was the first weekend that we saw, by and large. When we went into the second weekend and we looked at the retakes and then also the retakers today, uh, we saw almost all of them having two LRs. Yeah. And so they knew uh, that they had a real set. But let's cover those two real sets. Before you do, sure. if you don't mind me just completely interrupting. Um, yes, let me, let, right me make, let me make two Please comments. Please continue. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> let me make two comments on the content that you just talked about. One has to do with the experimental section and a theme or a trend lately in experimental reading comp where they seem to really be leaning into like some pop culture stuff, particularly television shows. Yeah. Um, we've seen them do this with a uh, passage on the Golden Girls in an experimental section. There's been passages on the, I guess, the movie Twilight. So we've seen in a number of experimental passages in recent years that they seem to be kind of in touch with uh, the youths. 
So it's very likely that in the coming years, we're going to start to see that becoming more of a theme in, in the scored content, as you would expect. The Utes. But I, the Utes. But I do find that to be interesting. The second comment that I want to make has to do with the, the passages that we predicted from January 22, where we said that not only would we expect this test to be reused, but here are some of the topics that you should be familiar with, because we get a little pushback on this idea sometimes. It shouldn't matter if you're familiar. And in principle, that's true. But in practice, if I were to say to you, mm, gas, giant, planets, cores, and metallicity, you probably have no idea what I mean. But if you actually do know what that is, and then you see that fourth hard passage on exactly that topic, it's impossible to think you wouldn't have some slight advantage. So that's why we do these crystal balls. That's why we try to make these predictions is because when we can see this coming, it's, up, it, it's ultimately to your benefit to know in advance. So that to me, that one passage stood out so much as like, it was a nightmare for some people and it was a gift for others. And that was largely dependent, the split there was largely dependent on if they attended the crystal ball and paid attention. Let's say you went out and you looked that up. Does it answer the questions in your passage? No. But what it does do is this, it allows you faster uptake. You're a little bit more comfortable with the topic because maybe you have a little bit more general background information. And then secondly, and very importantly, it gives you confidence. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm, I'm in the game on this. I know, I know a little bit about this. And we saw that with like the GMO foods. We saw that with the gas giant plants, the Borgia's stuff. It's like, it gives you this advantage and the confidence people like that. It's not that it answers the questions and no LSAT is, is out there where you need to read something beforehand to answer the questions. The information is in the passage. That's not what it's about. It is about a degree of confidence and yeah. comfort. comfort. And those things during the LSAT are of peak value. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah, they've also done some passages on hip hop recently when you start talking about pop culture as well, uh, Outcast in specific. Oh, that's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've been um, doing some kind of like work in that general vicinity and it's it's literally like very interesting to see the pop culturistic stuff that they are getting themselves into. So, but you make a really good point there. And then of course, the uh, My Cousin Vinny, uh, Youths, Utes, Utes reference, hopefully all future lawyers caught that. Good movie if you haven't seen it. <laughs> you know, it's funny. The first thing I thought of when you said you've been doing some work in that vicinity and mentioned Outcast, I was like, when were you in Atlanta? But now I know what you mean. Some tests in that vicinity in terms of time. Range. I've been I've been looking over past tests in preparation for future crystal balls. And it's kind of like seeing what's floating around out there. So deep research, as they say. All right. Let's take a look at the retaker reading comprehensions. All right, so this was primarily in that second weekend uh, that we saw this being used. You could have had some of the passage sets that we just talked about, though. They do mix and mingle a little bit. Uh, the first passage in this 27-question set was actually from a reuse of a test that was from January 2020 and August 2022. So well-known to us. Here we come again with it. The first passage was about international cybersecurity and regulating illegal activities, something that's very important and certainly a rising issue. Then a passage about Native American mobilian jargon, really pidgin languages and how information is exchanged there. Then we have a passage about the science of aging, uh, talking about lifespan and genes and cell senescence. Uh, so kind of like a tricky sounding science passage. And then we end with a comparative passage that, that it sounds uh, interesting, but I have heard that this is a very difficult passage about art forgeries art replicas and their aesthetic value, and Van Meegeren uh, with Vermeers. And there aren't many, very many Vermeers, so if someone was to find one, it would be worth quite a bit. Uh, so you can imagine why art forgers would be interested in replicating a Vermeer that's out there. This is not the easiest section, especially that last passage, difficult, but we've seen this passage a lot, so we feel pretty comfortable with our analysis of the difficulty of it, which we'll talk about during the scaling. And then today... With the retaker test, uh, the 24th, another real section, 27 questions. This one has been used all over the place. Uh, it appeared in January 2019 as an experimental section. It was used on the October 2020 LSAT Flex. It was appeared in August 2021, as well as a regular test in use. And it was also used this past April, uh, in April 2023, as an international test. So matching with the logic games that we talked about. This is scored as well. The first passage about Things Fall Apart, the uh, Chinua Achebe novel that helped uh, kind of like reframe the Ingbo language and traditions. Then we have a passage about EMF, lytic 
Gation, which is electromagnetic fields, who's responsible for the loss of property value? Is it the homeowner? Is it the electric company? And so forth. Then you have the publicization and privatization of public works projects like highways and so forth. That's your comparative passage. And then lastly, fun guy, fungi. I like fun guy because it's more fun. Spores on trees act as endophytes and they protect trees from damage. So again, a test that has been used quite a bit. This is the kind of test, though, that they wouldn't mind pulling out for a small set of people, as we said, just over 100 who took it out today. Um, I will say this. We did a quick confirming check on what we were seeing, especially with the real RC and the real Logic games. We're comfortable that most, if not all, the test takers had it today. The LR is a little more fluid. Harder to get information on LR. So the LR that we've cited is real for this test is one they've used as real in the past. It's from the same usages. So when we get to LR, I'll cover that as well. So there you go, John. Yeah. Those are your four RCs and an experimental section that didn't count, but your four scored plus one experimental in there. Yeah. Final thought on today's the makeup uh, RC, which is this. It's... Um, this was not a test that we predicted for this August, in large part because it was a test that we predicted for April and June, that October 20, August 21, that reuse. And sure enough, in April, it was used overseas, but those people got a huge advantage because we told them to go bone up basically on fungi spores. That's how I'm going to say it. Um, but the idea of like, what is an endophyte? What does that even mean? That was something that we told people to go research prior to the April test. People overseas who did so saw this content and got a huge advantage from it. And I talked to a student today who had watched that crystal ball in anticipation of the April, June, and ended up taking today's retest. And they were like, what do you know? It ended up paying off for me way down the line. So three tests later. later. Yeah, right. But I mean, there it was. So again, it speaks to the benefit and the advantage when we're able to predict these kinds of things as to just uh, how useful they are. So, All right, John. There you go. This brings us to LR, which is uh, more of a lift uh, in terms of the amount of work that we have to do. Uh, and because of the easy to confuse nature of multiple LR sections, we are going to focus mostly on the real sections. Uh, I will toss out a, a quick comment to retakers about an experimental LR that they had. Uh, when we get to that particular point, or maybe you will. But one of the things that uh, we don't do with LR is just because it's so confusing anyways, we just isolate the real sections and say these are some of the big hitter topics, or at least things that you might remember from that. And then we're able to go ahead and, and uh, you know, hopefully you can remember if that was your first LR or your second LR, if you did not, if you had two LRs. So... John, I don't, you know, should I toss it back to you for this? Sure. I'm happy to do it. There's enough to get through here that we can probably share the wealth. Yay. But I'll take the first weekend at a minimum, which began again with content, real LR content from the January 2022 test that we predicted in the latest crystal ball. So no big surprise to us to see these topics. This was a real section on that first Friday and some of that first Saturday, 26 questions. Here were a few of the notable topics. I think the section began with a question on driver's licenses or on a driver's license. It was a question in the section on midwives versus physicians attending the birth uh, at a hospital. A uh, question about Mozart, I'd love to see this question, playing Don Giovanni, a mayor appointing to a voter committee only people who agree with her on transit. I like that. And then finally, wolves and their pups moving uh, the dents, a relocation of the little wolf families. Yeah, in like a 10 kilometer radius. Yeah. I don't know the collective noun for wolves, but there you go. You ever wolves. done that? Looked up collective nouns for like animals? I love collective nouns. Collective nouns. I imagine in this case otters, it may... It's called a cuddle, like that kind of thing. Yeah, a murder of crows. A murder of crows. I feel like it may very well be a pack in this case, but... That's, yeah, that was too obvious to me, but that's probably right. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> obvious is right, man. That's like saying in question two that B is the wrong answer. That's it's too fair. easy. Yeah. That's fair. Trust your gut. So that was a real section that people saw. Um, again, primarily used that first tumultuous weekend, but it wasn't the only section of LR that we saw on the first couple of testing days. There was another real scored section of LR. This was new content from what we can tell, and it appears that this section only had 25 questions in it. Don't go by question count, though. Go by topic. And here were some of the notable topics in this real section. 
There was one about skeletons uh, being somehow indic indicative of the armor size that the wearers would have uh, needed. There was, and this is a question Dave kind of alluded to earlier, a question about caffeine. Cola and soda companies using caffeine to get people addicted uh, to their drinks to buy more. Yeah, there was in uh, there was in the other section too. Yeah, um, that was floating around. Yeah, so that again, they love these duplicate topics. We saw it on vitamin C. There was one even about hotel refunds. I think here maybe in an experimental section. So multiple. Sure. Yeah, um, back to this real section though. So skeletons and armor size, Coca Cola, cola, sorry, and caffeine. That's my Georgia instinct coming out. <laughs> question on dingoes in this section. A lot of people were talking about a question on phantom limbs and amputation, brain sensations. Uh, and then a question on primates and aggression when they're kept in small enclosures. So those were all real topics in a real section as well. If you can match even one of those uh, conclusively to the content that you saw, that entire section is going to be scored for you and will count ultimately towards your final result. Yeah, like the skeletons and the British armor and the sizes of things or the dingoes question, which I think was about kangaroos as well. But for a lot of people, the phantom limbs and the brain sensation uh, is is one that really stood out. Heard a lot about that. Heard a lot about the skeleton. So those two, if you can remember, that was section one and how you felt about that. That means that section one was the scored one. Yeah. And John, while you were talking, I did look it up. It is a pack of wolves. Okay. So just thought I'd confirm that for you. But I also noticed that a group of owls is called a parliament. And I thought, yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> See, this is really the service we provide. <laughs> the test is secondary to this crucial knowledge. People are, you use it all the time, like a pride of lines. It's not like it's a big surprise, but it is actually really cool. And uh, there is an LSAT question about a group of crows. They called it a flock. And I, and I used to ask classes when I would teach that. I'd be like, do you know what it's really called? And every once in a while, someone would know. I'd be like, they couldn't say that on the LSAT though, a murder of crows, because it sounds like it was actually the verb that uh, they, they were being killed. Yeah. So they had to switch it. I've gotten into this, like playing as a bar game with friends where you look at groups of people and you try to figure out what their collective noun would be, like a hostility of bros, that kind of thing. <laughs> it's uh, hostility. Yeah. Anything to amuse myself. But there you uh, go. Yes. All right. Let's go to the retake weekend uh, where we actually saw a fair number of experimental sections uh, in use. You could have had some of the earlier ones as well. Uh, a lot of the people on the first weekend didn't have two LRs. They had two RCs, for example. So they would have known that their LR was real in some of these instances. Not always, though. In the retake, what we saw was we first off saw a set of questions. It was 25 questions, if I recall correctly, uh, from both used in January of 2020 and August of 2022. Uh, and there's a few really notable questions in here. There's a question about the portrayal of Romeo and Juliet that people uh, certainly identify. There's another question about a synthetic blood supply, which I think sounds fascinating. Uh, there's one about running barefoot versus running with shoes. Those three alone for most people will evoke a very strong feeling of which section that was. There's a question in there about oil wells and pipeline, question about entrees and side dishes, another one about male and female dragonflies and the preferred habitat. That section was in fact real. So you can count it in there. Obviously, there's many more questions in there, uh, but that should be enough for you to identify it. Let's go to another section. This one was also 25 questions, and it had appeared on the January 2020 LSAT as well, just pre-pandemic at that point. Uh, this mm -hmm. question, this section, if I recall correctly, has questions on things like squirrels and rattlesnakes, curb parking on a street after seven, evergreen trees, a uh, question about yawning monkeys, one about LDL, HDL cholesterol, and heart disease, another one about uh, major museums. Uh, and kind of like um, natural disaster response and the proportions of what's going on. Another about tolls and highway funding. So that was also a real section. For a lot of people, it was really confusing because they had another section that had some challenging questions in it. So I'm just, I, we usually don't do this, but I thought I would just isolate that section because so many people saw it on Saturday and Sunday. All right, what we just talked about was real. The following couple of questions is experimental. So it was a 25 question section. There was a question about art gallery prices for two artists and the proportion of like abstract and non-abstract art and like the average prices. Hard question for a lot of people. That was an experimental section. That same section, if I recall, had underwater sonar detection when an animal gets near it. 
uh, in the water. Another one about kind of an odd question about vegans and nut allergy and gluten-free and for 20 people and how many of each that they needed. That section, if you recall which one it was, that was not the scored section. I think from I'm glad you. I'm glad you threw that in. Yeah, because I've been asked a lot, especially about that art gallery question from people, and I've had to be evasive and coy all week because it was too soon to tell anyone. Um, oh yeah, but, I got a yeah. lot of questions about tell me the experimental. I'm like, I know <laughs> it, but we've agreed not to. Uh, but that hopefully will help just a little bit there. If you're like, wait a second, I can't remember if that was one or three. Either knowing what is real there or knowing what is experimental. If you had two LRs over uh, that weekend set of tests will um, you know, suss that out for you. The people who took the test today, uh, going back historically, the LR that pairs with this is 26 questions. It's, you know, was used uh, back in October, 2020. Here's a few of the questions uh, from that. Uh, sand vipers and snake venom, which I mentioned before. Uh, books and bindings, if I recall correctly, it's Italian law books. Question about cast iron pots that we've seen uh, before. Dark feathered b- bird bones and Neanderthals. Old people having shin splints, uh, questions about databases and index cards. That has matched that RC and LG content from this test um, the whole time they've used it. And so that uh, there's some tough questions in there early on. Uh, so it can feel like a much more difficult question or, or section, but it does even out a little bit uh, as you kind of like move through that section. All right. That is is all the coverage of what is real and experimental. There's a lot of yeah. information, so much so that we had to take a break in the middle of it to talk about, you know, <laughs> groups of crows and, yeah. and and so forth. I will say that if you had a different test, and some of you did out there, uh, I saw online and, and we received some notes that f- featured uh, Roberto Arlt in your reading comprehension section, go back and check episode 95 of our podcast. We talk about that test and its variations uh, at that point. I think that's a really small group of people, but I wanted to mention for the few that I know who had that particular uh, lineup, you should be able to hear everything uh, in that podcast. We felt we had enough content here that we did not want to add it in. And so then, John, that brings us to the final ascent of this Everest uh, type of summit, (laughs) the matrix of the scoring scale. We've arrived at last. We have arrived. So let's talk about how we do this, especially for those who've never been here before and who are like, what the heck is going on here? We have historically put out predictions about the scoring scales for individual LSATs. Uh, It was a lot easier when there were just two LR, one RC, and one logic game that were being scored. We could predict those uh, pretty close. And historically, our predictions have been very accurate. Uh, They're very often right on the nose. Uh, Sometimes they're off by one, uh, but rarely more than that. So we're pretty comfortable in terms of what we're doing. We use a lot of different information. Obviously, we take student reports. We take instructor reports. As you can see from our discussion of the usage of this test, we've seen all these sections, almost all of them, uh, over time. We have a vast amount of information on each one of them. And that huge database from our past informs our difficulty predictions. So it's not just guesswork. It's not like, I think this is what it is. We feel very comfortable making these predictions. And John, you and I have said many times before, the day we don't feel comfortable doing something, whether it's a crystal ball or predictions, we won't do it. I'd rather say nothing than say something wrong. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That will be uh, the day we stop trying this, frankly. So far, though, um, the hits continue. So yeah, we've been on the money so far, but you're right. We're always on the lookout for moments where we feel like we're not able to do this well, and we'll be the first to admit it and pivot. All right, so this is how we do it. We are focused on how many questions you can miss at to get a 170. And the reason we do that is, is the high level difficulty is easiest for us to see coming out of this. The nuanced difficulty of scores in the 150s, lower 160s, a little bit harder. So we use the marker to say, how many questions can you miss to get a 170? And we start with a baseline of you can miss seven. And then we take each section and we evaluate it for difficulty. And that section will have one of three basic responses. Either it'll have no impact on that minus seven. Uh, In some cases, it'll add a question. So you'd move your scale from seven to eight. Uh, Sometimes it would loosen it. 
and go from seven to six. And so what you do is you listen through each of these sections. You say, well, what games did I have? What reading comp did I have? What LR did I have? And then you add that up and add it on to that minus seven. And maybe you find that you could miss nine questions on your test, or you could miss eight questions. And we do talk a little bit of the nuance, and we're going to, especially in logic games here, about how the sections may not change the scale at 170, but they were difficult enough that as you get down to the 160 level, it would move the scale yeah. uh, a, a little bit. So there is nuance to this. I will start with logic games, John. Yeah. Before you do, I, I think you meant tighten it to go from minus seven to minus six, but the idea remains. Yeah. Appreciate that clarification because it's been a long episode and I'd probably have too much of the hurricane. It takes a anyway. village, man. It takes a village. <laughs> it takes a village of rum producers. All right, let's start with logic games here. Again, minus seven. Let's talk about what each section does. We'll start with the one that we saw right out of the gate on Friday from January of 2022. This is the section on fruit displays, book volumes, landscaping, and then actor scenes. This section is really pretty much in the middle. It's 23 questions, but when we've seen it before, we've always said that it has no impact on the scale, and that continues to hold here. So if you were at minus seven, you stay at minus seven. Next, the new section about the book club, uh, the various departments like recreation and sanitation and three buildings, the medical interns is the last hard game. This is an interesting section, John, because the last game is legitimately hard, yeah. but the first two games are not. So if you're at the 170 level, it's not going to change you. It's going to be a zero. If you're at the 160 level, though, I think it does loosen it. And in the past, we have called this a 0.5 section yeah. where it has downscaling impacts, but it doesn't not that last game's not hard enough for people in the 170s to think that they should be missing more. It may be unfair, but that's the way that it is. I, yeah, I don't know that All right. unfair is necessarily what it is, but it, it can feel that way. I'll say this too, just as a quick point is use your own experience to help gauge this too. If you're a 170 plus type of scorer and this felt like the hardest game section you'd ever seen and you perform markedly worse than you normally do for good reason, then you might feel like, all right, that actually is going to loosen at a point, despite the fact that these guys are conservative about it. Yes. And we are always conservative. Given the choice of having a looser scale or a tighter one, we will say that it's the tighter one because that'll give you more benefits on test day, a surprise higher score as opposed to a, a surprise lower score. All right. Let's go to a section that a lot of the retakers saw this past weekend. Uh, and that starts off with the school project presentations, people traveling to towns, the vet, I think, the senior and junior employees, and then the breweries and beer, a really rough game at the very end. But once again, we've talked about this repeatedly. At the 170 level, it doesn't move the scale, but it is another 0.5 scaling where it moves the scale as you move downward from 170. So... Uh, we've talked about this one, and I think, John, you and I know more about this particular section than than almost all others. Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of information on it, and I'm very comfortable with that assessment of difficulty. Let's go to the last one, and that was the one the retakers today mostly saw. That would be the camp activities, the auditions with the musicians, the clay tablets, and then ending with the tough game, the fashion brands. And guess what? It's the same lineup. At 170, this has not moved the needle, but it does. Once you go below 170, it's another 0.5. So for a lot of people who just listen to this, if you're looking at 170, you stay at one, you stay at minus seven. Yeah. So all these had 23 questions. It was remarkably consistent that way. Uh, if you're looking at a 160, your scale loosens up a little bit more because of those last difficult games that you run into. John, I'll leave you to do the RC. Yeah, I can hear it now. Somebody's, but I'm a 165. What happens to me? <laughs> First of all, you're no. very special, so thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm, we're too tired. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually inclined to believe that uh, most of that movement you mentioned would happen at a 160 probably happens through at least the lower part of the 160s as well. So I yeah. think a 165 would probably go to a minus eight type of adjustment here, but at 170, I think you stay at minus seven. Exactly. That sense. That's about the spot where I would agree with you. Yeah. All right, let's talk reading comp. And there were four different scored sections of reading comprehension used uh, throughout the past couple of weeks as well. So bear with me as I go through these, but I'll start with the first thing that we saw on that original Friday, the test we predicted, January, 2022. Uh, and these were the passages on Borges, if I'm saying that right, Borgs, 
Uh, biotech. No. I know. Borges. I know. <laughs> biotech, violent movies and their effects on kids. And then, of course, the tough one at the end on the gas giant planets and their cores and formation and stuff. This was just an uh, indisputably hard section. We talked about it back in January of 22 as being difficult. We saw the same type of feedback this week, past weeks. Um, this is going to loosen the scale everywhere by one. So if you had that set of passages and you were sitting at a minus seven for 170, this will move you to a minus eight. I'm confident about that. Me too. The other thing that we saw, I think through that original weekend, partial reuse of a January 2020 test. These were the passages on airplanes flying through volcanic ash, microhistorians, uh, Native American sovereignty, and then that diet shift and the isotopes and stuff. This section by all reports was not nearly as bad as the other one. And again, this is all relative. I don't want to say this was easy, but it was certainly easier. This to me was probably a zero as I think about it. Uh, I don't see this moving the scale really anywhere too much. It felt, felt doable. And I heard reports from people in the 150s up to the 170s, and they all said the same thing. It's like, that wasn't bad. Any disagreement, Dave? None. All right. Then let's get into the retakes. Uh, the weekend retakes that we saw, the use of the January 2020 test that Dave went through, um, this were passages on international cybersecurity, mobilian jargon, science of aging, and then the art forgery, I think that would have been Vermeer. Another hard set of passages. Again, we'd seen this before, so we knew kind of what to expect from the difficulty and the reports this time were consistent as well. I think this is also going to loosen the scale by one. So again, if you had these passages at a 170, you go to a minus eight. And then finally, today's passages, uh, and this is the last set of real passages that we saw. Again, we talked about some of the sources of this, October 2020 being maybe the biggest. This was Chibe, EMFs and litigation, privatization of things, and then the fungi spores and endo fights. This was, I think, a hard section. Maybe not quite as difficult, but I think it's enough to still move the needle, even at 170. So I think this loosens it from seven to eight as well. So three of the four reading comp sections are going to take you to a minus eight. The one about the gas giants, the one about the diet shifts, and uh, sorry, the one about the gas giants, the one about the art forgery, and the one about the fungi spores, EMFs. Each of those is going to move the needle, I think, to minus eight. The only one that I don't think is going to affect it is uh, the airplane and volcanic ash, the diets and stuff. Yeah. And which means if you're following through this, you could be at minus seven. You could be at, uh, you know, minus seven and a half. If you've got one of those zero, but, you know, downscale tests, you could be at eight, eight and a half at this particular point. You could have any one of those. And that's why we say, find your section, just add it in there. And then if you're thinking, well, I'm eight and a half, it means that, all right, you're probably going to miss eight questions to get a 170. But as you go down to the 160s, you get a little bit of a bonus from that half is how that actually works. And then let's bring it on home with logical reasoning, of which there are five fun sections for us to cover. Most of these, I'll just give you an advance notice, do not move the scale. Uh, we have talked about four of these five previously, and they all zeroed out as having no impact at the top of the scale. It doesn't mean they weren't hard in other places. So talking about that one we saw on the very first weekend, about the driver's license, midwives, the uh, mayoral transit committee, the wolf den. This was a 26 question section. It does not impact the scale. Then you had the new section on skeletons and the British armor, the dingoes, and I think kangaroos, phantom limb pain, uh, primates and aggression. This is on the harder side. This will loosen your scale by one. Then you've got a lot of the retakers encountering the dragonflies, Romeo and Juliet, the synthetic blood, the oil wells, the barefoot running. That has no impact. And you've got the squirrels and rattlesnakes, the curb parking, evergreen trees, yawning monkeys, and so on. Also, no impact. And then finally, our test takers today with the shin splints and the cast iron and the feathers and the anderthals, that 26-question section, also no impact. So you can see how you could really get a lot of variations here. And that's because there's so many. You, also, John, notice how it's subsetted. There's that first weekend, second weekend, and these finally, these retakers. There's a very specific type of scenario that's happening. Like if you were a retaker today, mm -hmm. your scale comes out as minus eight, but it's got that half point on it that positively impacts your scoring as you get down to, say, the 165 level, uh, down to 160 and so forth. 
So hopefully that covers all the versions of this test. Uh, and if it doesn't, send us a message. Let us know so that we can add it to the kind of roster of things. And we'll tell you what we think your scale would have been as well if uh, something that you had didn't match up here. Uh, it would be really difficult for us to kind of like produce individualized scales, though, for 165, 160, 155, uh, it, especially with this much information. And I think, John, quite honestly, at this point, you and I, this was probably the longest two weeks that I recall where an LSAT got extended and there were so many problems that first week. I felt like I was doing uh, much needed triage and customer service for a lot of people who were really in some degree of distress and I had a lot of sympathy for them. So if you fought your way to the end and you got through this LSAT, you should congratulate yourself. You should have a drink bigger than the one I'm having right now because you made it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all those people who had to take two bites at the apple or even, even three, three bites at the apple or eat even on their first try, we're having problems, we're being affected. So the first order of business is say congratulations to all of you for getting through this. If any of it wasn't clear, we tried our best, uh, even though we wandered off topic occasionally. Uh, let us know. Uh, it has been a long haul and in really just amazingly enough, in two and a half weeks, less than two and a half weeks, we have the September LSAT that is going to be punching us in the face. <laughs> Although hopefully only with content and not with issues. Yeah, we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, but for the point that we have now, one of the big concerns that people had was, will I get my score on the original set release day, which was Wednesday, August 30th at 9 a.m. Eastern? Yes, you will. Even if you took the test today, they can turn it around that fast, which, of course, begs the question, why don't they always turn it around that mm -hmm. fast? Because they usually have retakes and they want to make sure they got it right. So I wrote a blog post about it. A long time ago, that still applies. John, any final words here? Uh, you know, I'm thinking back, Dave, to some of the comments you made at the end of the last episode, where we went through a lot of the issues that people had faced, uh, because I thought you did a really nice job, very eloquent, eloquent and, and encouraging uh, words of wisdom at the end there, where you talked about, to me, really what is like how sweet this is all going to be, despite having gone through this, or perhaps how sweet it's going to be because you really struggled to get there. The view from the mountaintop is a lot more beautiful when it's hard to get there, when the climb is tough. And that I know for a lot of people represents the experience they just had. Um, so not only will I echo Dave's point of like, congratulations on getting through this. I hope you're thirsty, you've earned it. But also to say that, um, you know, I hope you can look back on this, what was a rocky experience with some degree of like satisfaction, maybe a higher degree of satisfaction, because you really have earned uh, the score that you get. And I hope it's the one that you want. I have to second that. So that brings us to the end. And if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else that you may find it. And if you've enjoyed it, and we hope you have, uh, despite this one going kind of long, please leave us a comment and a rating as well. And if you have any questions, you can send those to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. You can also reach out to us on social media places like Twitter, X, Reddit, all these different areas, no matter what they are actually called. On behalf of John and myself, thanks so much for listening. Congratulate yourself on getting through this and persevering against really what was perhaps the worst LSAT test administration in history. Uh, fortunately, they got much better the second weekend. That gives me some optimism going forward to September. In the meantime, if you're preparing for that test, uh, stay safe out there, study hard. We will talk to you soon. Thank you.